Friedrich Nietzsche is one of the great inspirational thinkers of all time. Uh, powerful rhetoric, of course, but also his ability to put his finger on fundamental issues that all of us who are thinkers and want to have something passionate in our lives uh, find ourselves thinking about and responding to. And certainly some of his more powerful phrases have percolated into popular culture. Live dangerously. That which does not kill me makes me stronger. And particularly when we are younger and we have our sense of our lives uh, ahead of us uh, as a great romantic adventure, much of Nietzsche's prose can thrill us and his uh, appeal has been remarkable across a wide range of political positions, a wide range of religious positions and cultural positions as well. One, for example, I imagine uh, getting up early in the morning, uh, perhaps climbing a mountain before daylight has, uh, has fully emerged. You want to have a special experience. And then just as you reach the peak, the sunrise occurs. Quote, one emerges again and again into the light. One experiences again and again one's golden hour of victory. And then one stands forth as one was born, unbreakable, tensed, ready for new, even harder, remoter things, like a bow that distress serves to draw totter. So while many people thrill to this romantic adventure sense of life that Nietzsche exhibits, Nietzsche is also one of the great critics of human psychology. It's with all its potential for pettiness for cowardice, for hypocrisy. And Nietzsche also finds himself regularly wondering why so many people not only fail to seek their best, but to betray their best. Where does this widespread weakness, this willingness, and sometimes even the need to obey, the envy and the pettiness come from, and why is it so widespread? And of course, it's not just the great mass of people, uh, even those uh, who have a reputation for accomplishment in their life, the great philosophers and theologians and politicians. Nietzsche also has a brilliant reputation for being the na best name caller in intellectual history. Plato, for example, he dismisses him as a coward before reality. That's a literal quote. Plato sees this kind of messy physical world with all of its imperfections and retreats to this higher ideal perfect world of forms. What a coward. Take reality as it really is. Christians with their willingness to fall on their knees and prostrate themselves and declare their unworthiness Plato, uh, or sorry, rather Nietzsche, you know, dismisses them as, as uh, beings who only know how to worship their God by debasing human beings. Kant, with his uh, penchant for kind of rationalistic, logic-chopping, web-spinning, uh, Nietzsche declares him to be, a, quote, a catastrophic spider, the way spiders, these, you know, dark creatures that like to hang out in, uh, in dark corners and cubby holes and spin their webs to trap the unwary, it's kind of a brilliant negative metaphor to capture Kant's philosophical style. And politicians of the, the welfare state who, uh, under a pretense of benevolence, want to control us and look after us and treat us like children with all of that life-sucking paternalism built into a strong welfare states. He uh, dismisses the welfare state as, quote, the coldest of all cold monsters. And with all of the uh, name-calling that Nietzsche engaged in, uh, of course, many intellectuals of his generation and beyond have returned the favor. There's an anecdote when Nietzsche was a professor at the University of Basel. 
Many of the philosophers there were contemptuous of him and actively urged their students not to take courses from from Nietzsche. And for a while, actually, Nietzsche had uh, yeah, no no students in his class, partly because he hadn't uh, built up his reputation among the students, but because of the act of campaigning against. Him. This is from uh, one of his biographers for a time, quote, Nietzsche, then professor of classical philology at the University of Basel, had no students in his field. His lectures were sabotaged by German philosophy professors who advised their students not to show up for Nietzsche's courses, unquote. So the disdain is often mutual. Now, of course, uh, we don't really remember who any of those uh, German philosophy professors were, but we do reckon with Nietzsche. And one of his great themes is the theme of the death of God. God is dead. And by that, of course, Nietzsche does not mean that there was a God who has passed away, but rather that what God stands for, the idea that there is a creator overwatch being up there in the sky somewhere who is telling us what to do. We don't really believe in that anymore, or we kind of sort of believe it, but it's very hard for us in the modern world with our rational uh, independence, our the growth of science, our individualists, just to kind of uncritically accept this old-fashioned belief sense. But then what this does, of course, besides putting us in a crisis of realizing, oh my goodness, if we can't rely on religion for all of our traditional truths, where in fact are we going to find a replacement that's, uh, that's good enough? But uh, for philosophers, the question then is going to be, and this is for Nietzsche's question, if it's the case that we don't get our understandings of the way the world came from and the where it works and what we're supposed to do with our lives from religion, then uh, where, in fact, do we get religions from? And where does our traditional morality come from? And if it's the fact that there was no God who, in fact, delivered all of these moral commandments to us and created the religions around them, then that means that we made them up. And that then raises an interesting follow-up question. Why would we make up the kinds of religions that we have made up? Why would we make up the moral codes? And Nietzsche is going to offer a psychological interpretation of religion. And that if you have then have a religion that desperately longs for a father figure in the sky or a kind of being who's going to tell us what we're supposed to do with our lives, for a kind of religion that asks us to fall down on our knees and confess our weakness and, and ask for atonement, what is this saying about the kinds of human beings that are going to create a religion like that in the first place? Of course, Nietzsche is going to uh, to beat up on religion quite a bit, but we find that this psychological thesis is broader than religion. We find the same thing manifesting in politics. The vast numbers of people who want there to be a messianic-like political leaguer who will take care of them, whom they can kind of abase themselves before, who will solve all of the big questions of life about myth and meaning and so forth and tell them what to do. And certainly in personal relationships, we find the same sort of thing. Some people go into these racial relationships looking for someone to look after them, to tell them what to do and so forth. And where does this come from, uh, this psychological propensity toward weakness, toward self-abnegation, to feeling unworthy, to feeling emptiness and l desperately wanting for something else outside of yourself to fill that void. Of course, one possibility is to say that people are just born into a certain kind of culture and for some whatever, you know, historical reasons, you know, this culture has encouraged people to think less of themselves and to, to look outside themselves for, for meaning and values and to, to be told what to do. And uh, there's just large numbers of people just passively accept it by a kind of cultural conditioning. Of course, the other possibility is that they are born naturally feeling that way, and so they're attracted to a religion or a politics that sounds those themes, that when they hear those themes, it pushes their psychological buttons that are already there, and they respond on the basis of 
that. On the other hand, if it's the case, though, that it's, we, we, we go in the direction of the conditioning account, why don't we find more people willing to stand up and reject the conditioning as an affront to their pride? Uh, why is it they don't seem to have very much pride in the first place? You know, we know, for example, young kids, they take great pride in doing things for themselves and formulating their own tastes with respect to food, music, and clothing. And they're all you know, more than willing to push back against parents who say, you know, eat your carrots, the carrots are good for you. No, I don't eat carrots. I'm not going to eat my carrots. And we rebel and we push back if our parents say, these are the musical things that you're going to like and here's how you're going to dress and so forth. No, we're going to naturally have a dignity, a natural independence to want to formulate our own tastes in all of those areas. So why doesn't it extend, say, to religious conditioning? And we have a lot more people pushing back and saying, no, I'm going to formulate my own values, not just obediently accept and obey these, uh, these handed down values from, from other people. Now, on the other hand, if we say it's not just a matter of conditioning, then we're pushed in the direction of saying that it's natural to, uh, to some people. A large number of people to grow up in a kind of passive, accepting right way, that they don't really have much of a sense of who they are and what they want to get out of life. And so when the religions and political systems and so forth come along and, uh, and they are told to obey these commands and to do what they are told, then the, uh, the natural disposition is already there and finds ready soil uh, within, which to, uh, within which to grow. And that then seems to be strange because then we're pushed in the direction of saying there's not really going to be one human nature because lots of people, perhaps a significant minority only, seem naturally driven, active-minded to have their own direction in life, while then other people we're going to be pushed in the direction of saying are not that way. They are just constituted differently. Of course, uh, you know, suppose we want to, uh, to, to, to say maybe, and this is going to be counterfactual for Nietzsche, another explanation is that there really is a supreme being out there who uh, wants to you know, impress us with his majesty, and every time he appears, he wants us to, to fall to our knees and to grovel and just to obey and declare our unworthiness to him. Well, if there really is such a being, there's still going to be a kind of Nietzschean psychological question. I mean, of course, there's the secular, what kind of sick tyrant being would that God be if that really is the way God, God is? But uh, we still would have the question about the human response to that. Why wouldn't more human beings react to such a being with a kind of a, a healthy disdain inside? Now, of course, you might externally obey such a being. After all, it's got a great deal of power and it can make your life miserable if you don't obey, but inside, right, you are rebelling against this. You're preserving your independence, and you are looking off for opportunities to, to, to disobey, even to topple the tyrant, the same way that we would react as healthy human beings who want our freedom to any sort of tyrant who appears. So what we then have is the old nature versus nurture versus choice option. And what Nietzsche is going to, uh, to argue is that the proper explanation for this is a fairly strong nature explanation, a biological uh, explanation. What he's going to argue is that all of these moral codes, yeah, their God, in fact, is dead, so there really isn't the case that there's a God who delivered some commandments, say, to Moses that were written down once and for all, and so ethics is done from this uh, kind of uh, this extrinsic, eternal, immutable source. Instead, we're going to say that moral codes, we made them up. But the kind of moral codes that we make up are going to be a reflection of the kind of psychology that we have, but the kind of psychology that individuals have who are making up these moral codes is going to be a function of their biology. So here's a quotation from Beyond Good and Evil. I'll put the, uh, the exact source in the notes. Quote, It cannot be effaced from a man's soul what his ancestors have preferably and most constantly done. So what we then have to say is it's already written on your soul and it can't be effaced from your soul and it's there uh, based on what your ancestors did 
over and over for many generations. Now, there's a kind of uh, kind of Lamarckian evolutionary theory at work here. And uh, anytime we start talking about biological determinism in the 19th century, it's worth putting some dates to it. So Nietzsche was born in 1844. That means that in 1859, when Charles Darwin published Origin of Species, uh, Nietzsche would have been a precocious 15 years old, reading everything, absorbing all of the classics, and of course, the major intellectual currents of his own time. And one of the things that I think is most important about Nietzsche is that he is a second half of the 1800s thinker, one of the first to take evolutionary theory seriously and to incorporate into his philosophical system. And this is uh, one example of it. Here. So then what we then need to do further on is uh, argue that the uh, evolutionary account or the biological account is going to be most fundamental and we will then be giving reductive accounts uh, to biology of all sorts of psychological, cultural, and so forth phenomena. So another quotation from Beyond Good and Evil, one's moral code is a, quote, decisive witness to who he is is to the innermost drives of his nature. All right, now notice then that what we have is the innermost drives of one's nature. It's drives that are natural to us. And what your moral code is, is just a witness to what's really going on with these natural drives in you. So our psychological manifestations of our drives to the extent that we've put that in conscious word, verbal formulations, and codify it in moral codes, that is driven by these innermost drives. Another quotation, quote, moral judgments are symptom and sign languages which betray the process of physiological prosperity or failure. And again, it's uh, the moral code or the moral judgment. It's just a symptom of something deeper that's going on. And what's going on that's deeper is physiological. And you'll then notice that he added some, uh, some normative terms to physiological. Some of us are physiologically prosperous, like we are, we are healthy physiologically, biologically. And as a result of that, what we take to be moral is going to be one thing. On the other hand, if we uh, are, are physiological failures, right? In some case, there's a deep sickness or a deep dissolution that's going on in us physiologically. Our moral judgments are going to be symptoms of that as well. Now, what we then have is a, again a rejection of any sort of intrinsicism and certainly any sort of supernatural intrinsicism with respect to morality. We make up morality, but we make up morality based on what's going on inside of us psychologically. But what's going on inside of us psychologically ultimately is physiological. And so we have a kind of biological reductionism. Now, there's an implicit relativism that, uh, that Nietzsche then goes on to draw out quite explicitly. And this relativism is going to explain the difference between some human beings who seem physiologically very healthy. They have their act together. They have a great deal of vitality and energy and what seems natural and normal and healthy to them and the lifestyle that they want to lead is going to be one thing. But other people, in terms of their internal constitution, they are weak. They are sick. They are diseased. They are already decayed inside. And so what is going to feel natural to them psychologically and the mode of lifestyle that they are going to want to live will be a very different kind of thing. Are you looking for a new book to dive into? Then check out audiobooks.com. With over 150,000 premium titles, they have an incredible selection of books to get stuck into, whatever your genre of preference. Listening to audiobooks makes reading incredibly easy and enjoyable. Not only do you have instant access to thousands of titles, but powerful narrators can bring the text to life often giving a book more meaning than just flicking through the pages itself. Do more with audiobooks and start your next book while multitasking, doing the laundry, taking a drive, going for a walk, doing exercise or something else. With audiobooks, you can even read your books with your eyes closed. Sign up today for a 30-day free trial and get three audiobooks completely free. Go to www.audiobooks.com and click sign up to get started. And please help support the podcast by entering our promo code Open College, which is all one word. 
fall in love with books again with audiobooks.com. And while you're online, please show your support for the podcast by leaving a review on your favorite media player. Now back to the podcast. Now, Nietzsche is uh, very fond also of animal metaphors, and this is a part of seeing human beings as continuous with other biological evolution. And one the, when the standard uh, biological divide that he draws upon is the divide between predator types of species Uh, animal species and prey types of animal species. So another quotation here where he contrasts, and this is kind of counterfactual, but if we start to imagine ourselves as philosophically consciously formulating what a moral code would look like for various kinds of animal species, uh, we come up with very different moral codes. And so there's a relativism that's built into biological nature. So I'll give you the quotation first and then we'll unpack it. Quote, contrasting lambs here with birds of prey like hawks and giant eagles and so forth. Quote, that lambs dislike great birds of prey. It's not seem strange. Only it gives no grounds for reproaching these birds of prey for bearing off little lambs. And if the lambs say among themselves, these birds of prey are evil, and whoever is least like a bird of prey, but rather its opposite, a lamb, would he not be good? There's no reason to find fault with instance, this institution of an ideal, unquote, pausing the quotation there for now. So, given that lambs are a certain kind of biological creature, it's also the case that lambs have a certain psychology, right? They want to stick together in the herd. They're fearful of wandering off on their own. They want things to be nice and safe so that they can grow up to be sheep. And, uh, and so what's good to them, according to their biological nature, if, again, we were philosophers for lambs or sheep would then be to say, we think all of the sheep-like traits are good, and then the opposite of those, the bad and the evil traits are going to be anything that is not sheep-like or a threat to the sheep lifestyle. And so all of the traits that then birds of prey are naturally going to have Since they are our enemies and a threat to us, they are going to be the bad and the evil. And that's perfectly natural. You're not going to fault sheep for having that kind of a moral philosophy. But then, of course, there is the whole predator side of, of the divide and the way the predator way of looking at things, the way lions and, and, and wolves and, uh, and, of course, eagles and, and others are going to look at things. And so returning to the quotation here, perhaps the birds of prey might view it a little ironically, that is to say, the, uh, the sheep way of looking at things a little ironically and say, we don't dislike them at all, these good little lambs. We even love them. Nothing is more tasty than a tender little lamb. And so the whole point is going to be that if you are a bird of prey, right, what's natural to you and your lifestyle and the way it manifests itself in your psychology and your way of acting, again, if we were to become philosophers of good and evil for the birds of prey, then it would be all of the predatory traits that we would be prizing and valorizing, and we would be looking down contemptuously at the the sheep way of life. And then again, that would be perfectly natural and healthy to us. And so the point is going to be that we are going to have dramatically different kinds of moral codes based on these dramatically different biological ways of life. And Nietzsche is going to argue that this predator-prey type of psychology or physiologically healthy and physiologically weak also runs right through the human species. So there's not going to be a universal code of ethics possible for human beings because human beings, while nominally we'll call everybody a human being, that is to paper over some very deep biological differences among human beings. Now, in the uh, the genealogy of morals, one of uh, Nietzsche's great uh, mid to late period works, a very mature Nietzsche working these things out, Nietzsche says that what we're doing is a genealogy of morals. So rather than seeing moral codes as once and for all having been delivered to us by a transcendent source, instead what we have is organisms uh, trying to survive and developing a psychology and habits of life that are, are going to enable them to survive. But then, as we know from evolutionary things, things change over the course of generations and generations. And so we should expect 
different species and different subspecies to evolve, different physiologies, different psychologies, and then uh, uh, different uh, uh, moral codes to the extent that those can be can be uh, made uh, explicit and codified. So what we then need to do from our now you know late 19th century perspective is look at the moral codes that are kicking around in our generation, in our time, and not just take them as set in stone, but rather ask, where did these come from? What kind of people or what kind of psychology would give rise to this kind of moral code as opposed to that kind of moral code? Now, Nietzsche is, of course, very distressed by the prevalence of the Judeo-Christian moral code, and uh, in his view, the secularized versions of them, a strong egalitarianism, let's uh, all be equal and share our toys, strong socialism, uh, you know, the government is going to look after everybody and make us all the same, and everybody, again, will be one big happy family and so forth. So what Nietzsche is interested in doing is to ask, where did these moral codes come from and what explains their cultural prevalence? Why is it the case that, of course, we still have plenty of people kicking around who have a great sense of independence and vitality and are, who are not ex- afraid to buck convention and go their own way and perhaps even become tyrants themselves? But it doesn't seem like we have a lot of those people and certainly not enough of those people from Nietzsche's perspective. So what explains the origin? origin of what he comes to call the slave moralities of his times. And uh, that label then means that he wants us to go back many generations to, of course, the mother religions of the Western tradition, Islam coming out of the Semitic traditions, Christianity also coming out of the Semitic traditions earlier on, to the original Semites and the Jews or Hebrews or the Israelites way back when, and Nietzsche points us to one formative experience in early Jewish history, and that is when, in fact, the Jews were slaves under the then powerful Egyptians. Now, at that point, what we have is the master group is the Egyptians. They're able to do whatever it is they want to express their values, and they have the power to make their values and their lifestyle to happen. But the Jews at that point, as uh, one of the enslaved peoples under the Egyptians, find that then they cannot do what as human beings they naturally would want to do. That is to say, come up with their own ideas about what their lives are going to be, pursue their own values in their own way. Instead, what they have to do is live the way slaves do. That is to say, they have to obey. They have to, uh, uh, when the master strikes them, not strike back. They have to, when the master tells them to wait around, wait around, and so forth. And so the point is going to be for Nietzsche, what does this do to the psychology of a human being who, over the course of many years and then several generations, is uh, having to live as a slave? And there's going to be a conflict inside anybody who is in that situation because any organism wants to live, and it wants to live according to its own identity and its own nature, pursue its own goals, pursue its own values. We all have a will to power, and we want the power to be able to express our own will. But what happens when you find you are existentially in a situation where you cannot exert your own power, and existentially, you have no power. What you then find you have to do is that you have, of course, a certain amount of psychological power. You can control your mind and your feelings to some extent, but you can't manifest those the way that you want. Instead, because of your circumstance, you have to use your psychological power on yourself to stifle yourself, to control yourself, to mold yourself as much as possible into a slave who's actually going to survive. And you have to do that because if you act the way a natural human being would act, you will suffer pain. You will suffer dismemberment. You will die. And if you have children, it's going to be important that you teach your children how to live properly as a slave because children who do not learn how to grow up to be good little slaves, they also are going to die. So if your goal is to survive, And to make sure that your children survive, you're going to need a new kind of moral code. And you're going to have to drill it into yourself and make it your second nature. And you're going to have to drill it into your students or your your, your children and, of course, your students culturally to pass it on to them and make it their second nature so that they can survive 
the actual slavery that they are involved in. So what's going to be first and foremost is obedient. You have to learn how to be obedient. You have to learn how to be patient. When you are struck and abused, you can't take avenge. You you have to kind of find a way to forgive, to get it out of your systems. You have to be willing to bear humiliations and cultivate a humiliated and, 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 and humble demeanor. All of these things are going to maximize your chances of actual survival as a slave. And that's what you are going to teach to your children. And so that's going to be a new moral code that comes into existence. And it's going to be a moral code that is precisely a new lifestyle to enable individuals and cultures that find themselves in certain circumstances actually to survive on for many generations. And then to the extent that it becomes uh, manifested over the course of center, second, uh, several generations, even when that culture leaves its, uh, its actual slave status and becomes independent, it's going to be ingrained evolutionarily into that group of individuals. So what we get in summary from Nietzsche is the idea that ethics is functional. Uh, it's a tool of survival. In part, it's a tool of expressing who you are most fundamentally so that you can survive and, uh, and, and go about your lifestyle in the actual world. But sometimes, given your actual circumstance in the world, what's going to be functional is going to be different. If you are in a position to exert your will over other people, that is to say, you are in a master position, you're able to master other people and bend them toward your will or use them as tools of your own power, then you're going to have one kind of moral code. But by contrast, uh, if you are in a subordinate position, uh, what you will then find, of course, that ethics is a tool of survival, is going to become a tool of self, uh, self-expression, but it's going to be the expression of a code that you have instilled stilled in yourself so that you can survive in your subordinate position. And then, of course, over time, what happens is that both of these moral codes as externalized have some influence on the next generations, and they, so they become cultural vehicles as well as being uh, psychobiological vehicles. So what we then have by the time we get into the modern world, and this is to print in very broad strokes, just imagine a spectrum of master types to slave types at the opposite ends of a spectrum and people falling at different points along that spectrum, though, is two types of psyche. Some people who are weak constitutively and some people who are strong in terms of their natural biological constitution. Some people then who are uh, 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 psychologically vital and energetic and other people who are weaker and more passive. And then on top of that, an overlaying cultural uh, codes of values that have been made explicit for each of those types, and they will be in conflict with each other. So ethics is natural. It is functional. It's a source of self-expression, it's a source of survival, and it is a cultural manifestation of a psychological type. And of course, the relativism is, uh, is built into this as well. Now, by the time we get into the modern world, we are starting to use the label altruism for one of these types of moral codes. Now, the master code is uh, egoistic in the following sense, that you have an ego, you have a self, you have your goals, and, uh, and what you want to do is augment your power, including power over other people, to get what you want out of life. But we do now have this other moral code that is not egoistic, at least initially, seeming not seemingly into a but is officially altruistic. It's alter from the Latin word for other. It's about otherism, and so it's a principled otherism. And of course, that is uh, rooted in the slave morality, because the slave is not at all allowed to have an ego, to have a self, to have goals, values, and so forth, and say the slave is totally a tool of others. It's a tool of the master, and so everything about the slave is directed toward the other and the best slave is going to be the one that is totally other focused and teaches his or her children how to be totally other 
uh, focused. But then what we have is that the two are going to look at each other very differently. If you're a strong person, if you're a master type, then altruism just seems contemptible. It seems to be you know, a sign of weakness. So why would I want to be a servant of others? Why would I think that other people are more important, that their goals are more important than, than I am as well? On the other hand, altruism as a moral code, aside from simply being an expression of the slave morality, it does in fact become useful as part of a strategy not only for survival, but as a weapon against the strong. Because one of the things that we know is that to the extent that we can convince other people to be more altruistic, to be less egoistic, then those other people will be less self-assertive. And to the extent that other people are less self-assertive, they're less of a threat to us. To the extent that we can use the altruism to make them, uh, to valorize the weak and the humble and the obedient, and to be servants, to the extent that we can get other people to buy into that moral code, then there's the chance, of course, that they will also uh, give us some stuff out of charity. Uh, rather than keeping it for themselves. And so that's going to increase the chances that we'll be on the receiving end of getting stuff that we, we want. And so what Nietzsche then has is a very provocative phrase where he argues that altruism is in fact a kind of egoism. It is in his phrase, the egoism of the weak. And so in the case, for example, of uh, Jews and Christians, he wants to argue that they still are human beings. They still want power. They still want to survive and flourish and to see their agendas uh, made realized in the real world. But they cannot use the traditional tools of the masters because they don't have that kind of power. Instead, their moral code is a kind of power that they can use against the weak. It uh, enables them to band together in a herd like a, sh a whole number of sheep, and so there's safety in numbers, and it gives them a sense of security and a sense of emboldenment. You know, so uh, in many cases, you know, the sheep will face up to the wolves if they have, feel that they have the, the safety in numbers, but also to the extent that they can get some people who are perhaps in the middle psychological territory between being masters and being slave types to make them a little less threatening, to make them feel a little bit guilty about their strength and their riches and whatever it is that they have, and to give more to the weak in, in, in the form of charity and, and, and so forth. So the idea then is that this altruistic moral code is a functional tool and it can be used to advance the interests of the weak. So altruism is the egoism of the weak. Friedrich Nietzsche was famous for his statement that God is dead and his provocative account of master and slave moralities, and also for the fact that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis claimed that Nietzsche was one of their great inspirations. Were the Nazis right to do so, or did they misappropriate Nietzsche's philosophy? Professor Stephen Hicks's concisely written book, Nietzsche and the Nazis, based on the 2006 documentary, corrects many widespread misconceptions about Nietzsche, giving a fascinating and easy to understand analysis of Nietzsche's work, asking and answering a number of questions, such as what were the key elements of Hitler and the National Socialist political philosophy? How did the Nazis come to power in a nation as educated and civilized as Germany? What was Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy? The philosophy of live dangerously and that which does not kill us makes us stronger? And to what extent did Nietzsche's philosophy provide a foundation for the horrors perpetrated by the Nazis? Professor Hicks demonstrates his mastery of this subject using quotes and critical analysis that prove his points and show the true linkage between Nietzsche and the Nazis and how philosophical ideas move the world. Get your copy of Nietzsche and the Nazis by Stephen Hicks on Amazon.com today. And while you're online, please leave a review for the Open College podcast hosted by Hicks himself on iTunes or Stitcher. Now back to the podcast. Now the phrase that altruism is the egoism of the weak comes from Twilight of the Idols, one of the later works of Nietzsche. And uh, as evidence uh, that even people who are apparently weaklings and totally altruistic and selfless and self-effacing and humble and so forth, he notices that many of their spokesmen, right, the great monks and theologians, will manifest a certain kind of power. 
And he says there's some very interesting psychological territory here. Of course, there's a lot of people he thinks really are just cheap. There's not really very much going on. But there are many people who are born into an altruistic system. They're born into an, uh, you know, a strongly Jewish, Muslim, or Christian tradition. And they absorb its lessons, but really their nature is still to have a certain amount of intelligence and a certain amount of vigor and a certain amount of vitality. So what's going on inside them is a conflict. And out of this deep conflict can come some fairly poisoned stuff. So if I, for example, think that I am weak, that I'm not one of the people who's had this, uh, you know, been born into a glorious, aristocratic, wonderful lifestyle, and I kind of hate the fact that I don't have that lifestyle, but at the same time, I kind of believe that I'm supposed to be weak and humble and obedient, right, and so forth. And so I hate myself a little bit for being the kind of person that I am, but I also, I hate the strong and the rich and the powerful for being the kinds of beings that I am. That kind of self-loathing and other loathing, Nietzsche says, leads people to to a desire for a certain kind of revenge. And we always want revenge on those who make us feel bad about who we are and the kind of lifestyle that we have. So he notices, for example, how many theologians and monks in their writings will have this kind of revenge fantasy against the rich and the powerful, but their revenge is going to come in the afterlife. And that what they're going to project is that in the afterlife, of course, there is this great, powerful being, their God, who's finally going to give them everything that they want, and they're going to have riches up in heaven. But all of their hated enemies in this life, the rich and the powerful and the beautiful and the adventuresome and so forth, and the guys who are getting all of the women, those guys are going to be sent to hell, and they are going to have bad stuff happen to them. And what's going to be especially good is that I'm going to have a front row seat up there in heaven watching this happen to those guys. So Nietzsche, for example, quotes Aquinas. Aquinas is one of many here, Tertullian, Augustine, Jonathan Edwards, and so forth. But here's Aquinas arguing or stating rather, quote, in order that the bliss of the saints may be, may be more delightful for them and that they may render more copious thanks to God for it, it is given to them to see perfectly the punishment of the damned. All right, great. So your life sucks now and you've bought into a moral code that says you have to be humble and obedient, but secretly you want revenge. You want to have power over. And so you have this entire revenge fantasy that's going to come in the afterlife and you'll get to see uh, those guys suffering. Now, Nietzsche is arguing, of course, that this is quite sick, uh, this, uh, this envy, this resentment, this uh, self-loathing that's redirected into, uh, into this revenge fantasy. All of it is the sign of a poisoned psychology and a poisonous anti-human moral code. And he also uh, argues that it's very close to a kind of nihilism, that you know, if you are not actually feeling that you're going to get out of your life what you want, that you're too impotent and you kind of hate yourself for your impotence and your failure to achieve, that you would really just rather see the whole world destroyed and blown up right, rather than have to admit that there's something wrong with you or wrong with your moral code. And so here's a quotation from Day by Day, Daybreak where Nietzsche puts his finger right on the, uh, the pulse of these kind of envious nihilists. Quote, when some men fail to accomplish what they desire to do, they exclaim angrily, May the whole world perish. This repulsive emotion is the pinnacle of envy, whose implication is, If I cannot have something, no one can have anything. No one is to be anything. All right, so resentment, envy, hatred, revenge nihilism, all part of a psychological soup of a deep and pathetic weakness, but that pathetic weakness can come out in the form, obviously, of a moral code, of a religious code, and various social and political movements. Now, I want to close by raising a few uh, critical questions about Nietzsche's philosophy. Obviously, uh, uh, extraordinarily influential, and Nietzsche wants to urge his philosophy upon us and to, to, to have us be aware of the dangers of uh, slave morality in all of its forms, overtly 
religious forms in in uh, strong Buddhism, strong Christianity, strong Islam, strong Judaism, and so forth, but also in non-religious forms in the various egalitarianisms and 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 uh, kind of strong democracy, strong socialisms, and so forth, because his fear is that to the extent the people buy into this kind of uh, more any set of moral codes in that swampy territory, it's going to undermine human potential. That human potential only can come from those who have a strong sense of values of their own self worth, of their own potential for doing something magnificent, and who are going to go out and do it no matter what. So another quotation here about the dangers about the slave morality is that it will make the potentially strong, quote, sick and miserable and malevolent against himself, full of hatred against the springs of life, full of suspicion against all that was still strong and happy. And so to the extent that all of these slave type moralities and their offshoot have cultural prevalence, then they become a threat to the next stage in human evolutionary potential. In that case, morality would be the blame for human beings not becoming as good as they possibly can. That's another paradoxical formulation initially that morality is a bad thing if it's a morality of the the slave type. So, quote, precisely morality would be to blame if the highest power and splendor actually possible to the type man was never in fact attained. But precisely morality was the danger of dangers. Now, there's a kind of paradox that is uh, um, uh, endemic to any sort of relativistic epistemological accounts and, and, uh, and moral accounts as well. So we find a version of that in, uh, in Nietzsche. So for example, what are we supposed to think about the slave morality types. And on the one hand, if we take seriously the idea that there's a herd morality and there's a there's a there's a kind of a predator morality and that uh, one is born uh, say as a sheep or one is born as an eagle, if it's the case that these beings can't help being what they are, you know, wolves are going to be wolves and sheep are going to be sheep, then why would we use the language of revulsion, the language of moral condemnation with respect them. And what we find is that Nietzsche seems to be doing both of those things. On the one hand, he is saying that, you know, the sheep can't help being sheep and wolves can't help being wolves, in which case the moral condemnation language would be inappropriate. And the same thing then would apply for human beings. If it's the case that some human beings are born more sheep-like and some are more and more wolf-like, then we wouldn't be saying that one is wrong and one is right for human beings. Instead, all we would do is not moralistically uh, make judgment calls, but make kind of aesthetic judgments. If I am, for example, one of the more predatory types, then I'm going to have an aesthetic revulsion to the idea of living like a sheep. But that's just a subjective judgment for me as the kind of human being that I am. And so at most, we would have a certain amount of aesthetic contempt of the predator types or the master types for the weaker or the herd types. But we're not injecting any kind of moralistic language. But at the same time, we find consistently in Nietzsche that he does use absolutist language, where he does say that the slave types of human beings are contemptuous. They're unworthy of being considered human beings. They're a disgrace. They're a real danger to the future of humanity humanity. Now, for example, we find, and then more specifically, in this whole language of altruism, egoism, and whether altruism is a kind of egoism of the weak. You know, if we were to ask Nietzsche, should human beings be egoists? And uh, Nietzsche's official answer seems to be, well, it kind of depends. Uh, yeah, it would depend on what kind of a human being you are. Uh, We might say, you know, it's natural that all human beings have a will to power and we're each going to assert ourselves. Well, in that case, if it's uh, natural for all human beings to have a will to power and to manifest itself, then we can't say it's wrong for the weak types, the slave types, to use their moralizing altruistic strategy. It works for them. It does enable them to survive. It does enable them to weaken their their enemies. It does enable them to get a certain amount of goodies for them and to keep their lifestyle going. 
though it then again the moralistic con- condemnation to say that they are an objective a bad threat to the human potential that would be inappropriate we just say it's a different kind of human lifestyle that seems to be to be working for them but at the same time nietzsche does again appeal to kind of universalistic implicitly objective standards you know there really is a human being that has a certain type and it has certain evolutionary potential and that the good and the best for human beings is for them to achieve that potential the improvement of the species to bring about the overman and that herd morality is an objective threat to the realization of that so when he says, for example, there, quote, the healthy's right to exist, the privilege of the full-toned bell over the false and the crack, is a thousand times greater. They alone are the warranty for our future. They alone are liable for the future of man, unquote. That's from Genealogy of Morals. So he's really saying that it's only the master type, the healthy type, the egoistic type that, that is actually worthy of living because they are going to bring about the overman and so forth. So Nietzsche uh, is, does strike me as being stuck in this relativistic paradox where he is speaking out of both sides of his mouth. He is, on the one hand, by his official philosophy, seemingly to be pushed in a relativistic direction, just saying there are different moral codes and they work for these different substrains of the human type. And we can't say that one is right or wrong because we don't have an objective stance. We can only be speaking from one or the other stances, whichever one we happen to be a part of ourselves. At the same time, he does seem to be stepping outside of the human condition and saying there is one healthier, better more admirable direction for human beings to go, and only some people are going to be able to achieve that, and the others are a betrayal of actual human potential. And so this uh, language, for example, of whether uh, uh, altruism is the egoism of the weak, again, we are stuck in a kind of paradox here. Uh, Nietzsche, on the one hand, wants to say it is the egoism of the weak, and egoism is natural to all human beings. On the other hand, at various points, he says, egoism should be severely limited, and we should only allow the better kind of human beings to be egoistic, and we should discourage egoism from those who are contemptuous and a drain on human potential. Now, this is, of course, an ongoing question for Nietzschean scholarship and for more generally subjectivist philosophies in general. Perhaps part of the continuing giant stature of Nietzsche on our cultural landscape is that he really does attract these two different audiences. He does attract those who are looking for inspiration to make a great romantic adventure of their lives. And he does attract those who are grappling with the very deep challenges of skepticism and subjectivism coming out of a materialistic evolutionary philosophy. You're listening to Open College on the Possibly Correct Network with renowned philosopher and author Dr. Stephen Hicks. Stay up to date with the latest releases and news from Dr. Hicks by following the podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Minds.com and Gab or sign up to our email list at www.opencollegepodcast.com. While you're online, please show your support for the podcast by leaving a view on your chosen media player. You can check out all our podcasts by following Possibly Correct on Minds.com. <laughs>